So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mr. Zinus. I'm the former president of Minnesota Library Association, the only cricket association here in the state of Minnesota responsible, uh, who takes the leadership in promoting the sports of cricket and you know playing our games all that. We have about 180 games that we play throughout the season, but that's not the only thing. Cricket is the second most popular sports across the world, and it's gaining a lot of traction out here in America as well. Just like this concept out here, there are actually at least three or four states that are actually looking at building cricket stadiums with some multi-sport multi facilities. Indianapolis is one. Fort Lauderdale in Florida has already done one, and they've been making a lot of money out of it. There's a real great value out here too. I'll tell you, we go out to North America, and you see a lot of foreigners who come in to MSP, head out to Mall of America, you know, the train connection to Minneapolis, and the train connection to St. Paul. Consider an international game, or even a national game that comes down to this, to this part of the stadium when it's filled, will make a huge, big impact. Not only that, there are a lot of local businesses that are for people who actually support cricket in Minnesota, support Minnesota Cricket Association, as well as some other sport activities and development efforts that they're doing. Just last year, about $5 million was pumped into development efforts in Minnesota, and we have, we have an op opportunity to really get that chunk of money. And that money basically comes in from an organization called ICC, International Cricket Council. It's a kind of a hidden sport, but it's really picking up. And I'll give you another example here too. I have a gentleman with me here, Ben, who recently moved down here from England last year, and there are a couple of good, great opportunities that you know when he and I were, were chatting about and we talked about. Big, big Bash League in Australia was started about what, three years ago. Well, about three years ago, it's a multi-million dollar sports event that happens over two to three weeks. Similar events have popped up in, across the world. Really started from India with something called Indian Premier League cricket. Something similar that is being planned for America and venues are being sought. That's something within the next three to four years that will become really, really big and huge in America as well because the game is picking up. If you guys probably remember, last year in the month of June, Pioneer Press featured cricket on the front page. And I always wondered why they featured it on the front page. Obviously, they had some data uh, to support that out too. We also did an engagement with Minnesota Twins last year. And this year, we'll probably be able to do a pre-game or post-game game demonstration down at Minnesota Twins Stadium. That is definitely an opportunity that a lot of people are seeing. <coughs> Overall, there's an economic impact out here to really look into how multi-purpose sports facilities can be built and more sports like cricket or maybe soccer or other sports can be incorporated. Natural Sports Center down here in Blaine, we have been talking to them for a while. We actually had a facility out there a few years ago and they were really hoping that we'll be able to bring some national games on and all that too. That was like 10 years ago. Today we have a great opportunity, there's a lot of cricket being played, a lot of money that is coming into that sport as well, and it is going to happen. And I think it's really, around, really an opportunity out here for St. Paul and, and you know, for the city of St. Paul to really consider something like cricket to be part of a multi-sports facility. Thank you. It's hard for you to see if, if you, there's a, there's a uh, you can go online and look, but Cricket, they, their, their field is an oval. And it actually fit in here rather nicely in their main playing areas there. Okay, we went through that, there we go. And now real quickly, earlier in that video you saw the existing floor plans and Mr. Hughes is gonna speak in a little while. Um, he had the opportunity to tour it a couple days ago. That's what we have now. Uh, those dots are about 27 and a half feet on center. So it gives you the size of the massive, of that massiveness of that building. This is the floor plan again because I listened. This is the lower level now. Uh, parking, pretty much end to end. That's where Fifth Street hits Broadway. You'd have a, a lighted intersection there, an easy in. And on this end are the three existing doors. So people could come in out, you know, from the bend to the back into area into downtown St. Paul. Hundreds of parking spaces without a lot of expense. This is floor two. This is the main floor of the building. A lot of you know the front entrance of the building. It's up there on Fifth Street at Broadway. Interestingly about these floor plans, 
you know, the angle marks the, the section suggested for cutout. But around the perimeter, there's existing stairwells and elevator shafts. So it's almost like perfectly positioned for reuse. One other thing I wanted to point out to you, there's existing loading dock doors on this level as well. The building's <coughs> fascinating. And that's what you could do, uh, put the playing field on this level now. As I mentioned earlier, I raised it up. And there's also plenty of room for parking on this end, and this is where the commercial space could be. You could have a 30,000 square foot Minnesota Artisan Center. I met with a group of artists last fall, I suppose, and a woman, they love this idea, and she said, why don't you model it after the Kentucky Artisan Center? I didn't know one existed. I went online, it's in Brea, Kentucky. St. Paul can become, again, the epicenter of the arts in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. This is floor three. It's very open. This is what floor three could be. More parking on this end. Commercial space. This is controversial to some people. I like skyways. There's a reason why the skyway went up to the XL Energy Center years ago. It's about economics. Brought more money into the city, more conventions, more activities. Perhaps a skyway could come into this building someday via there. But on this level, I had illustrated about an 18,000 square foot commercial area. And I had the pleasure of meeting the Twin Cities Model Railroad Museum board. <coughs> how many of you have been to the Twin Cities Model Railroad Museum? If you've not been there, how many of you have been in there in the last year? Yeah, that's, a, that's what's been happening. When the, they were lured out there in the mid 80s to Bandana Square that was built as a specialty retail center. It didn't survive. And I believe one of the reasons it was rather isolated, there wasn't anything else to do. The Twin Cities Model Railroad Museum is the remnant of what was there. And their 80th anniversary is coming up, I think, in another two years. We need to get them back to downtown St. Paul. There's room for them in this building. There's actually a fourth floor in the building. It doesn't look like it, but it appears to be on the floor plan they gave me. It's up in the corner on Broadway and Fifth, I'm assuming. They won't let me in the building. <laughs> I'm sorry? It's a mezzanine. It's between the second floor and the first floor. Is it between? Is it? I apologize. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't know that. I thought it was the fourth floor. It was where all the offices were for the purchasing, planning, and all that. Okay. So it's actually below the second floor and above the first floor. God, you know, you're the only one who's caught this. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't know that, and nobody corrected me until just now. Well, let's skip the sports bar on the fourth level then. We can always add it later on. But you see the potential in the building. It's so massive, and the floor heights are so high. And then there's the... That was what I was suggesting for the, 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 the fourth level. The ceilings are very high. You can always add another level. I won't get into that right now. Then there's a massive rooftop. Each of these sections that could remain are about three quarters of the size of Mears Park. You could have the ultimate green roof up there. Uh, more seating. Somebody said, how many seats would this hold? I said, you know, they're shooting for 7,000. I think the beauty of this plan is you can grow the seating as you need it over time. You don't need to do it all at once. Somebody said, why don't you put a my, uh, you know, miniature golf course up on the roof? I mean, there's, there's plenty of things you can do. I know, Dave, you don't want that because you have one at the Schmidt Brewery. That's right. Okay. <laughs> but there's so much potential here. Okay. And, and again, it goes back to, you could make that building look like that in two years. I mean, it solves so many people's problems. Uh, traffic circulation a lot is, you know, can circulate around the building with the city's plan. You're going to have a congested mass. I'm sorry you are. Um, yeah, I, I, get, you know, I get very emotional about this because I've been downtown for 19 years with my gallery and I've watched. And I've survived it. And I love this town. I'm sticking around. But this is a huge opportunity for the city. And I'm hoping Dave Thune will be a champion here as we go forward. And I'm done. No pressure. Okay. <laughs> and when we finish our presentations here, I want... I, they, Charles, yeah. Charles, we forgot Charles. There will be plenty of time <coughs> for questions and answers when we're done, and if we have to stay here until midnight, we will. We'll answer your questions, your comments. If you have suggestions, we'll write them down. Charles Senkler is a good friend of mine. He owns fabulous ferns up on Selby Avenue. If you've never been there, go. All right, well, 
glad to see everybody here. And I just want, I have one really singular point that kind of sticks in my craw. And my, my experience, I've been working in the hospitality industry uh, for 35, 40 years. I worked for Walt Disney for a couple of years on some of their bigger developments, Disney Boardwalk, um, Swan Hotel, Dolphin Hotel. I've worked with the American Indians. I did a lot of design work out of Treasure Island. I built with Norman Crooks the first two high stakes bingo rooms at Little Six, which is now Mystic Lakes. So I've been around it for a long time and I've been around a lot of pretty big time developers and playing kind of a small town, small time role in it. Uh, in 19, Oh, about 1989, Michael Eisman decided Disney could make more money doing animated movies versus building nightclubs and bars and restaurants. So I uh, packed up my bags and came back to St. Paul, and in 1991, two partners and I bought fabulous ferns at 400 Selby Avenue from the St. Paul Port Authority. And the building had been dark for a couple of years. It was a the last remnants of the St. Paul ghetto. It was rough there. We got a great price on it. It was the only place we could afford. So we went in and we developed it, built it out, and have been running it for 22 years. Uh, we have been very involved in our community. In 93, I started the Cathedral Hill Business Association, and that still exists with 60, 70 active members. And, and it's been just a great experience for me. I was and through those experiences, I gained a lot of knowledge on how big time developers do things. And if there's one thing any developer, any successful developer worth his salt does, is he investigates every possible avenue. He looks at the upside, he looks at the downside, he looks at the impact of the community, he looks for support from the community, he looks at his, his, his revenue streams, he evaluates everything, and then he makes a decision based on the impact of the community and the profitability or the ROI of, of the project. Well, this I don't think has really happened. And I see the ballpark, I met Bill maybe a year ago, looked at his drawings, very talented guy, and I've, I've worked with some very talented people, he's exceptional. Uh, and I asked myself, why won't the city just study it? You got $54 million, take 25,000, get, get an independent engineering group or an architect and have them review the two plans. There might be great big problems with bills. I, I can't see them, nobody that's reviewed them sees them. But why not, before you spend the $54 million, be square with the citizens of Lower Town, the residents and the businesses, take in input from them and actually see what their problems, whether it's parking or, uh, you know, they want a year round facility, they want model railroads, they want whatever they want into the mix of activities in that space, evaluate it, see if it's possible and make the right decision. I think St. Paul deserves that. I'm a St. Paul guy, I was born and bred here. I love St. Paul. Uh, I love Lower Town. The second ferns that we were going to do was going to be right where uh, the Bulldog is right now, and we got kind of uh, teased away by the city and ended up in a bowling alley on the east side, which is another horrible story. <laughs> but uh, I think, and I have, I, I participated 25 years ago on the design for Beers Park with the little winding. Uh, streams and all that, and at that time, and I'm trying to think of who the mirror was at that time. Uh, it might have been George Latimer. Yeah. We were trying to convince the city to, to lift the park up and build two levels of underground parking, put the park back down like they do. They have a lot of them like that in San Francisco and different parts of the West Coast. Uh, or look around, find all the building owners, find the most decrepit building in the area, do an eminent domain, tear it down and build a parking lot. You need parking, 25 years ago you need parking in Lower Town, today you need it even more. 
25 years ago, you needed any kind of activity that would create traffic, retail traffic, you know, uh, uh, take advantage of, of the architecture down there, take advantage of Mears Park. You need people on their feet, you need traffic, which is part of the city plan, but yet they, they take this, this great building and this building can be fantastic and they're just gonna throw it away. And uh, the other thing that a lot of people don't realize uh, in the world of sustainability and recycling and let's do something for the future of our kids and things like that, that building recycled with a decent purpose and a successful effort would be the biggest public relations thing St. Paul in the world today could possibly do. It would be on the front page of every architectural journal in, in the world. And it is things like that. We're the capital city of Minnesota. You know, it's, it's really, we have a leadership position in the state. It's not Minneapolis. It's not Mankato. It's not Mystic Lakes. St. Paul. <laughs> Thanks for showing up tonight, and I hope you get active on this, because I think St. Paul really deserves a break on this. Thanks. Okay, uh, next is uh, Tim Hughes. We're getting to the end here. I don't know how I have lost track of time. We we're probably running late. I hope you have patience with us because we do want it to answer, we'll stay as late as possible, answer everybody's questions, hear your comments. And Tim, by the way, is Senior Vice President of Alliance Bank. Uh, how Tim got involved in this thing originally, I think, was kind of uh, uh, self-serving, if you will. I wouldn't say that self, but he's concerned. He has some properties in the area, and and from the bank's perspective, they could see, unlike what's advertised, uh, that there are some areas there that that ballpark, rather than raising the value, would actually depreciate the value and perhaps even put them underwater. In other words, the property value would actually be less than what the loan might be worth. And and so I think any banker says, "Holy cats!" You know. So Tim got. Got, came into the neighborhood and starts nosing around and, and seeing things. Uh, he, be, he and Alliance Bank have become an, uh, an ally of ours in our lower town community. So by the way, anybody looking for a bank loan or looking for a friendly bank, I, I strongly uh, recommend his institution. Just like we have a great politician, we have a great banker here. But <clears throat> Tim had the opportunity, maybe you can explain it, to actually visit the facility. And it kind of happened because we were haranguing uh, some of the city people so much about the one of the things they said you can't put parking down there because parking is going to cost us too much money we don't have that in the ballpark budget we said well you don't have to have it in the ballpark budget maybe the ballpark can even make money off that parking with that great open space down there you could sell that to a parking lot company there's obviously a need and the uh, what <clears throat> just kind of some uh, statistics what we heard was that parking runs roughly for uh, concrete parking like this in, in closed 50 to 80 dollars a square foot depending on where in the United States it is and we believe that a number we've been come up with is less than 10 to 15 dollars a square foot you could put the parking inside there because most of it's already done finally Tim got into the building and got a chance to look at it and uh, why don't you go ahead with your comments Tim <laughs> Tim Hughes Alliance Bank fifth Six Cedar, Minnesota. That's where we are. Um, I've been involved with this group for about a month. I really enjoy it, and um, I I love. I know that uh, parking is a big big problem down there, and that's why I've gotten involved. I'd love to uh, ask the mayor someday if somebody came to him and said, "You have to, um, you know, that driveway where you park your car, that parking spot where you park your." in front of City Hall, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have you move at uh, six by six blocks away. And we're gonna, you know, when your wife comes home from shopping at the grocery store, uh, she's not gonna be able to park in the driveway in your front yard. She's gonna have to park uh, four or five blocks away and walk with her packages to the house. Yeah. And that, that's what really bothers me. That's what bothers me the most about this whole thing is that the city is ignoring the people from Lordtown. The businesses 
and the citizens of Lower Town, these condo kind of owners that are from Market House getting booted out of their parking, it, I just think it's a tragedy. And that's why I've gotten involved. And we were able to get into the building on Monday morning at 8 o'clock with a contractor. And the estimator that I that was there is actually one of the estimators who's been involved in building most of the ramps out of the airport. So they're going to put together a low ball and a high ball estimate on what it would cost to retrofit that lower level into parking. You know, it isn't going to be perfect because it wasn't originally constructed for parking, but you've got so much concrete down there that's already there and so many pillars there that you could probably design a parking ramp down there that would service a, a lot of the businesses and the people from the area at, at a reasonable price. So that's what we're trying to do. This contractor is gonna come back to us here. I called him today and he's, I know he's busy on some projects, but we're hoping to get a high bid and a low bid from him pretty quick. And then through Charlie and some other people we know, see about uh, the possibility whether what, there's a group that wants to go in and privately develop the parking, which is at least a start, you know, at least a start to maybe accomplish a little bit more here than, uh, you, know, you know, I think everybody loves the city. You know, people have to live, they gotta work, uh, they gotta have a, a convenient place to park. And so that's my involvement, and that's what we're trying to do. Okay, thank you. And uh, we, Dave's already spoken, so now we're at the part where we're really been waiting for. And our apologies are taking so long. I think we're over budget on time, but uh, we want to hear your comments. If you have any questions for any of us or any of the people that spoke, uh, go at it. We're ready for it. Uh, you raise your arm first, way back in the corner. Put the picture back up of the park. Put the picture back up of what? Of the ballpark. The ballpark. Uh, city or the Gillette? Uh, the outside, yeah. The outside, that outside view. Mm -hmm. Right there. You pass there. there. Now, which are we facing north? Facing west. Kind of north. Uh, south north. South 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 west. West. Southwest. I'll show you here real quick. What's your, uh, here's a thing real quick. Oh, it's a lot of time. Here we go. What I'm saying is the park is facing north. That is due north and then that is due west. So downtown is facing northwest. It's not facing due northwest. It's facing northwest a titch north. Did I say that wrong? No, you're talking about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did it, has anyone been here since like the 80s when you could go down to Golf Hero Plaza, drive underneath, go to the theater, go shopping, that kind of stuff? I remember that. And then I've been here as a pastor and a pastor of Church Calvary Chapel of St. Paul in downtown St. Paul for over 22 years. And we've been at the Rossmore building and we eventually grew to over 12,000 square feet of space. In fact, we took over the old, all of 10th Street of the Rossmore building and built a 350 seat sanctuary. Had a couple of services, but when the Rossmore building got sold, they turned it into affordable housing. Cheapest condo was $250,000. Uh, all our parking went away, and we went from a congregation of 500 people down to like 150 people, because we had to bounce around, move around, and now we're finally back into Lower Town, St. Paul, and we're grown to about a couple hundred people now. And we love the farmer's market. We love the parking that we get there. And literally, all through the summer through farmer's market, we bring a couple hundred people into downtown St. Paul because we're not an east side or west side or a you know, central church. It, it allows us all to come into downtown St. Paul, which people love. But light rail and biking is just not going to do it. And the majority of people who go to the farmer's market buy stuff at the farmer's market and load it into their cars. Everyone who rides the bike has a little shopping bag. It's recyclable and it's green friendly. But that's all they can purchase. And all the people walking out with wicker baskets and uh, you know things like that. So I'm just saying we're just now growing back to a larger congregation. 
and now you're telling us that we're going to go back to that same problem where we're not going to have parking again in, uh, in the city of St. Paul when the same stadium and everything that you're saying at Gillette, I mean, everyone, I got people from the church here, and that's why we come into St. Paul. I'm an east sider, but I, I like the downtown, lower town. We, in the Rossmore building, we did the art crawl. We had a Christian art gallery, and it was one of the stops in the art crawl uh, of going through there. So having another artist community again, I mean, I just, I just can't see how not having a year-round facility wouldn't benefit the city of St. Paul. So the only thing that I'm thinking is, is somebody getting paid off, or is there like time involved? I mean, what is the deal that this doesn't look so obvious that you could have a year-round facility? Now I'm cheap. I mean, I unscrew light bulbs. My, I turn off electric lawn cocks on my kids. I mean, I want to save a buck, but this is like year-round. And uh, so that's just my thing is that we're just growing again as a congregation, but now we're going to be wiped out again with no parking. I want to respond. Very quickly, I want to talk about the farmer's market. They are right here. When the city rebuilt their sheds, I don't know if that was in 98, perhaps. At the time, I'm getting my bearings here. I'm looking at this upside down here. This, this photo is a little old. Um, the northern lofts, they built a parking ramp here. Block 270 condominiums there. So what the farmer's market had back then was a surface lot here, here, and there. And of course, parking further away. What's now happened is that's developed, this is developed, and that's going away. You'll force the market out of Lower Town. Um, something's going to happen if you don't give them parking close by. Did the city have a plan for parking at all? Yes, this is the plan. You got, you're supposed to park down at Union Depot and walk. Or on the other side of Lafayette Bridge and walk. Or stand here and a shuttle's going to pick you up. I don't know who's going to pay for that. We do have a citizens uh, parking design committee. Good people, yeah. residents, businesses, yeah. uh, things like that. And they're wrestling with all sorts of problems that are that happen when this ha when this happens. We're losing a number of parking spots, as Bill mentioned already. Right. Yeah. Um, and then the estimates they're giving is maybe 3,500 cars coming into a game, but and they're saying, well, people walk six blocks to a, to a ball game. Problem is they won't start out six blocks away. They'll park in close and then move out. What happens then? is no one in any of the residential or small business buildings will have a place. They'll start with the street, then they'll fill up the surface lots. Um, it's, it's, exactly. It works for the Saints, it doesn't work for the community. And that's the problem that we're in. We're in a uh, in market house, and that's the problem. If we rent a garage space, or lease a space, um, if there's a game going on, they get to park in there. It's first come, first serve. We can't. We don't have any designated space, right. and that's the problem. You could have designated space in exactly. downstairs. Okay, yeah. right over there. Fitz Watson. We've lived downtown since uh, 1990 in Lower Town, and we've been very close to uh, uh, look out our back window and see the uh, maintenance building. Is it right down the way? No, the, uh, the other end. This one, right there. Right for us personally, it would probably be an advantage to tear down the, the large Gillette building, but I don't think it's the best thing for St. Paul. Uh, if it was torn down for us, we'd have a much greater view if we happen to look at a white wall. That building, I walked around that building. Just look at that building compared to the farmer's market. Huge. If you haven't gone up to that building, or haven't been in it, I've been in it uh, years ago, this is a massive, massive piece of work. And, you know, there are trailer trucks that, that, that drive inside that thing, I mean, on level. And so it, it is a, you couldn't duplicate that kind of a building today. Uh, and, and I just, it would just be an incredible uh, to have these four levels that could be used for purposes. Somehow, uh, at least we have a plan here. I don't even know what the city's plan is. So they have a drawing the, the that area was again. one that we weren't supposed to put in our head because they're still working on a plan. It seems to me that there's a, pl there's a plan here that has so many yeah. dimensions yeah. to it. The cost, I, I, I would like to see the numbers, but I guess uh, I'd like to think that this would actually come 
in at the number or lower. I'd just like to make one comment if I could. Where you live over here, with the city's ballpark plan, the game is on, where are all the noisy fans going to be? And you're going to be every home run or double or out that's made, double play, you're going to hear it all night long. Whereas the plan that, where's the, where's, 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 where's the plan that, where's the plan that, the, the other plan that stays at Gillette Building, the noise goes away from Lower Town and the residents, and also that large building kind of looks like a big noise shield. So I think that where you are particularly, I had to jump in. Anybody living down in this area, I think will find it to be a better neighbor noise-wise to have the building in place yet as a noise shield. My point is that if that is such a, a massive and uh, amount of space, covered space that could be used for so many things, it would just be a crime. I, I agree. I think the, the development cost would be about $125 a square foot. You know, if, if you're looking at a new space, new construction, rock construction, it's about a buck and a quarter a square foot to enclose the space. And, Put a Who's had their hand up the longest? Wave it. Me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I'm Liz from the Market House. And Dave, I want to thank you for being here. I really appreciate yeah. it. When I come to these meetings and sometimes I'm feeling like we have all these great discussions, but we're not in front of the right people, maybe. So I'm wondering like how we get in front of the mayor or we have yes. the right to mayor this weekend, but Where is the mayor? Yeah. Where is the mayor? The mayor should be here. Yeah, like how do we get in front of him? At, at, this, at this point, I mean, I'm, I'm talking real pragmatic and I've been around politics a long time. There needs to be piles and piles of letters and emails that go in before we can get somebody's attention. Because it's very hard to stop a train that's headed you know, one direction. What? Can you get his attention? Um, I've, I've tried, and I wouldn't blame it on the mayor. It's, you know, it's, it's an entire city bureaucracy that's working on this and, and with good intentions, but I think it's just headed the wrong way. I think you need to get pe people's attention by sending emails, phone calls, and letters. What about a petition or something like that? Emails, phone calls, and letters get more attention. Right. Petitions we just keep for our mailing lists. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a petition for you. There's a camera in the back of the room. And everybody who wants this looked at, you know, just, just looked at in a reasonable and fair manner, stand up and where's the camera at, Bill? Stand up and wave at the camera back there in the corner. Wave at the camera. This is your petition. We want the mayor. Okay. He's got a microphone in here, so they want Mayor Coleman. Okay. As we get closer to the end of this, I'll give you some contact information too. And there was a sign up sheet when you came in. Put your email address on there, contact information. Those addresses will stay blind, but you'll be updated as we go along. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question, actually. Yeah. There's been a lot of comments. Um, I'm sitting on the actual high school of Chuck. I appreciate it. I'm a new resident here. I, I just bought into uh, the part of Lost and the old firehouse. Um, so there's a question. It has to do with finance. It's not as exciting as talking about what we could do with this. But can you explain to me the city block? If we're talking about going with our current plan and you have, um, and one of our issues is that we don't have any tax cuts because we have so much nonprofits and federal state buildings and whatnot that do not pay taxes. If they put this in, um, there's going to be a limited amount of tax base you get out of it. You're depressing the value of like your, your location, and that will push down the property values. You're not going to be taking in taxes on the sales um, on the, the parking ramp or the, the parking that current existing. But with this current concept, at least there is a multiple stream of revenue that you can then have taxes and grow the base that we can then continue to reinvest in St. Paul. So uh, it's a real question. Why is St. Paul not looking at whether it's this plan or another plan to take this investment and grow to a greater revenue stream than a short uh, pop for a few years? We're the government. We're here to help. Um, actually, you hit the nail on the head. Um, a lot of the things we've talked about probably will cost more, because uh, what we're going to get is kind of a, a, you know, a fairly low finish uh, ballpark with the current plan. 
this will cost more, but that doesn't count the offset with revenues. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, Bill's mentioned a number of potential rent paying entities yes. that could move in. Uh, obviously, there's an offset if you're renting out the park, you <coughs> own the building, especially on game days, because yeah. who would want to park somewhere else if you drive it right in under it? Um, people have talked about, and I think this is wrong, that Lower Town just has to get used to a new normal, that there aren't going to be parking spots, you're going to have to take uh, mass transit and get used to walking a long ways with your groceries, and I just think that's wrong. And I think that uh, it's, you know, Lower Town is really special, and, and I've always thought, you go home with whoever you came with to the dance. And what we're doing here is trading off everybody that made Lower Town, Lower Town for something new. And I'm all for the new, but I think it's going to hurt the people that really made Lower Town what it is. And that's what's special about this. The ballpark needs to help the people that are there already, not hurt. There's another, another point to your argument, too. There's a, there's a certain amount of uh, political timing on the election cycle that relates to the, let's get this torn down, let's get some cranes in the air, let's get something happening. And uh, that's just not fair to the people. I mean, you sacrifice everybody's welfare for maybe the welfare of one or two individuals on a political career path. Well, I, who I, knows what that's all about? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm just getting, I'm not really discussing you know, the livability. Yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to make it so that it's a simple calculation. Right. Yep. Yeah. You invest X amount, you get X amount back. It's a number crunch. And yeah. you're, you're deciding to choose X, get back minus something by not investing in it. I just got a lot of numbers today, and it, you know, it does show some expenses, but I have not gotten the revenue side. And that's been promised to me, and I expect yeah. I'll see it ultimately. Um, I don't know what it is, but you have to include the revenue side, and then and then compare that with what if you did have to build another ramp somewhere else? We'd still be paying for it. So why not do double duty? So. From the get-go, I'll say real quick: this is a phased concept. You don't need to do it all at once. It's like when you build an office building; you build out the floors as you get tenants. I've said to the, some city staff for many, many months, get the ballpark component done. That part, the stands, the restrooms, the concession area going right on through the building, the front entry area. Get that done for the $54 million. As we're hearing now, maybe sell off the parking area to a developer. Get that off the city's hands. Gets it on the tax roll. Yes, Tim? I, I thought of a name for this ramp. You could call it the Lower Town Community Ramp. Yeah. Yep. And then you have a yeah. condoed out section yeah. for market house. Twenty four seven. They're their slots. Yeah. Yeah. Then you'd have a section for commercial business parkers where they just want to pay for eight to five or eight to six. Okay, they would pay less. And then after six o'clock their space is open to somebody from the wants to go to the Saints game or yeah. go to one of the other restaurants. Yeah. And then you'd have a public, more public area that would be public parking for people that wanted to come down and pay the five or ten bucks for their parking. To me, it makes all kinds of sense. And, and you're, you're not going to build the most beautiful parking ramp in the world because, but you've already got the concrete there. You've got the pillars there, and it could add to the, 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 the image of Lower Town, this cute little community parking ramp. They converted a basement to a parking ramp and it kind of fits in with all the other old buildings. And I think it would be beautiful. I really do. And I think the city is missing like the boat and they could, they could yeah. solve yeah. most of these parking problems that the people are having. Yeah. I'm done. Is there anybody here from the farmer's market tonight? No? Okay. I, t I talked to Jeff here a couple days ago, and he, you know, you put a sea of parking in the lower level right outside, you know, the door of the farmer's market. That's a big, you know, that's, that's really going to help them out. It's going to keep them down here. That's a lot of revenue every Saturday and Sunday morning. <coughs> yes, sir, in the back. Okay, boys and girls, here's the deal. What I've heard tonight, actually, I've been on those, uh, you know, for quite a while now. I've been following this for quite a while. Yeah. And uh, th what's being shared tonight, in my opinion, is absolutely brilliant. This is making a huge opportunity for St. Paul City uh, and every, everybody, for the wife and I are third and fourth generation St. Paulites, 
will be here forever, okay? But that being said, tearing this building down would be a total travesty. Total travesty, it would make no common sense. This is absolute common sense. Two plus two equals four. If we can't see us, we're all blind. If politics gets into this, I'll be damn mad, okay? That's it. <laughs> two years by Bob Parking. Um, this project is a prime example of our leaders, our leader, our mayor, not wanting to listen to what's going on. Dave Thune, I want to tell you a wonderful job. When you say to us that you're very sad about what's happening, I mean, you've got some guts. Beautiful, you're here listening. My, my council member that I have in my location where I'm at doesn't come to these meetings and doesn't listen. So I give you the captain's patch. Beautiful drawing bill. <laughs> the bottom line is, folks, if you lose the parking that you have here, you're going to have nothing, and I repeat, absolutely nothing but headaches. St. Paul's middle name is going to be lost parking, no parking. And this is the reality. If this gets done and they ran this thing through, which is what they're doing, that's the same thing they did, the same thing they did with the light rail, you're going to be so upset. Amen. Nobody's going to want to come downtown. Parking is huge. Parking is everything in downtown right now as you can see finding a place to park tonight was almost impossible for myself this has to be addressed before we go forward um, we need to fire the existing mayor he doesn't return phone calls he doesn't have accountability and he will not listen to people this is what we need we need the mayor here this is his pet project i want to let you know that this is the mayor's pet project you guys are all going to be negatively affected if this goes through and you're not going to be able to do something to slow it down. So I tell you, my building, I've got a property on university and I've been affected by lost parking. It's your livelihood and a lot of people, this is your life. You know, you can't find a place to park when you come home from wherever you might be. Wait till you have a couple ball games. Can you imagine the headaches? I just want to say the, the ballpark is not ready for prime time. And I, and I hope you guys write an email and whatever else. I'll send around my cards. Um, the best thing you can do is try and put a stop on it because if the parking doesn't get done, you will have nothing but a headache. Guaranteed. Thank you. Yeah.